you want to do, um, or what you're doing, or what's coming up, or what do you have coming up next week. Um, and, that, and that goes hand in hand with when the, something that's off topic from your question, but not from the panel. Um, just thinking about the theater smarts and etiquette. Um, be polite, be nice, be aware that you're not going to be the only creative person collaborating on this project when you're working on it. And in the life of your play, as it goes to other theaters and other places, remember that each production is not going to be exactly the same as the first one, and it's not going to be exactly the same as the next one. They're all going to be different. Let it go. You know, if, if you go from place to place and say, oh, um, I like most of this production of my play that you've done, but these two things have to change immediately because you got them wrong. That's going to turn that theater off and those people off from ever working with your script again or any, any, anything else you do. Um, be aware that other people are going to bring things to the table and maybe they're going to make your play better. Um, but again, be strong but flexible, as you said. Um, let them change a comma if it really works, if it sounds better. Um, if it doesn't, tell them. Um, but don't just, don't just be insistent that it's exactly the same everywhere it goes. Because, um, yeah, as someone who produces and as someone who does plays other than my own, it drives me crazy. When someone says, hey, 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 that's supposed to be horse with uh, red spots on it. Why, why did you use a, uh, a stallion? I said, because it's the only horse we could get. <laughs> you know, it's, it's imagination. Let it go. Thank you. Now I'd like to take some questions, because I know we all have questions. Or don't we? Uh. If we don't, <laughs> tell me that. OK, yes. I have an adequate thing on the other side of the aisle. When you send a play, or a query letter about a play, to a theater in Canada or a theater in Britain, you get back a letter. Might be a rejection letter, but you get it back relatively soon. Mm -hmm. When you send to most theaters, which includes City Theater, mm -hmm. you'll never hear back. You, you will won't even you hear a rejection. And, and I'm sorry, in this day of email, it is possible to do a little form letter and send it back to play. I've talked to several playwrights. And, and this is true of many theaters here in town, but it's, it's something true of American theaters. I understand that in Britain and in Canada, theaters are subsidized and they can pay readers and have an easier situation that way. But I still think just the simple acknowledgement of receipt, let alone rejection, is owed to any playwright who sends you a, a, a query letter I, or a I'd script. I'd like to respond to that. Yes? Because I think you're wrong. Oh. Um, uh, uh, OK. executive director of the South Florida Theater League, and I receive play submissions, which boggles my mind. And I'm generally good about saying, hey, I'm not a producing theater company. Find one that is. So my one of my advice would be do your homework and figure out who you're submitting to and make sure they're actually accepting. I'm sure what you were sending was a place that was accepting submissions. I've been there. There are plays of mine that I have not heard back from. So I understand that frustration. By the way, my little theater, and um, I founded the Gloucester Stage Company 32 years ago. It's been going for 32 years. In one year, we did uh, the created, right after Beckett died, I created the Beckett Fellowship and uh, for a playwright to come to Gloucester Stage, and we put it in the drama still quarterly. And we had 3,000 plays sent to us, and we didn't have a reader, let alone too few. We just, it was, 
you know what 3,000 plays look like? <laughs> <laughs> that was in the days when they were hard copy, right? That's right. You know? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> it filled a room, and, and so many of them didn't have uh, return envelopes. And we did, we did a form saying, I'm sorry, we can't read your play. And the ones that had return envelopes um, got the form. But well, see, so you did that. But wait, well, I'm going to respond to you, Kim. Yeah. Because when we founded City Theater 16 years ago, it was because I was that playwright. And I did want to write those letters. And so those letters were written. Everything was acknowledged. Everything, whether it was read, whether it was not read. 16 years ago, yes, sitting in the Ring Theater offices. And what happened was Stephanie Norman said to, we're going to go broke. If you keep having to do this because you're reading for free, you're responding for free, and you're taking it out of our budget and your own personal budget. So I said, well, what else am I supposed to do? Because I feel hugely guilty about this. I have been that playwright. So honestly, what I've done, or how I've had to deal with it, because we too have been sharing responsibilities with Actors Theater of Louisville, which means 1,200 scripts every single year, and a literary office of one, now two, back there, thank you very much. Um, I have put it in our submission guidelines that we will not be able to respond to you unless we are interested in your play. In that case, you will hear from us, and you'll hear from us about if we are gonna be able to do the play that year, in a reading, in a, a festival production, in a tour. It may be that I'll also hold that play for a couple of years until we get our cast right. And we can do that play, and we've done that. But it kills me, I'm a playwright too. I send my stuff out into the universe, and I don't always hear it either. And even if I have a relationship, sometimes I don't follow it up, which is my bad. That's my bad. But I understand all of us have that frustration, and the world is going very quickly past us. And when you have electronic submissions, too, like Larry, I mean, I'll get plays. I'll get plays without title pages, without contact information. And I'll think, gee, that was really good. Did I have time to put that play and that email together somewhere? Maybe not. I just downloaded the play. And then later, kind of went back to look at it. Oh, shit. I wonder who this is. This is brilliant. This is better than I could do. Gosh, I want to do it. And I don't know how. I think uh, more important this discussion is or, uh, the Gloucester Stage Company in 37 years, in 32 years, has never produced a play that came through the mail. Unannounced. I mean, it, it's, it just almost never happens. It's just a waste of time. I mean, I think collectively the playwrights of the Playwrights Lab over the years have come to the conclusion that. Uh, theaters produce the plays of playwrights who drop by and say hello. That's that's uh, an operative fact, would you say? And so the next best thing, if you can't drop by and say hello to every theater in America, you, re you really hone in on the theaters where you really want to work, where you really think your work is appropriate. Steppenwolf does a certain kind of play. You write that certain kind of play. Really approach Steppenwolf with, with, with that fact. Really do uh, what's I get suppose networking, you know, where you find out who's involved with that theater, so, so that you're not sending a script in blind. I, I think you might as well throw it out the window. And if it's electronic, I mean, can you imagine how many plays are sent electronically to Steppenwolf Theater? And if you, if you don't have a powerful New York literary agent working for you, why would you ever think that play is going to get read? Who the hell is going to read it? So I. I, I I think, you know, uh, the most important thing you can do is, is really analyze uh, which theater is, is likely to do your work. What, what kind of play you're writing or you have in your hand that you've just written and, and, and which theater is doing that, that sort of play. And, and uh, then, then you have a, a prayer and then, they, then really, you know, find some contact. My, my youngest son just uh, sold a book that he wrote, and I was really impressed that he, he, he 
he said he wasn't going to send it out to have it until he had an agent. It was this was him talking, not me. He said that nobody's going to read it without an agent, and he analyzed. Uh, the agents, the powerful agents in New York, who had represented books that were in the same basic gene pool as, as, as his book. He went out to the agents, he got an agent, and then that agent analyzed which publishers were publishing, would be likely to be interested in that kind of book. They went out at auction, they had, they had uh, two publishers bidding, and he's 25 years old, he sold his book, and it's being published. And, uh, I think everything he did was absolutely logical. Not magic at all. And, and, uh, and anyway. David, um, I yeah. wanted to respond. Yeah, well, I was going to say the refreshing thing about submissions is that it's a concrete action. It's something that you can do, that you can measure. You know how many submissions you sent out, you know how many responses, if, uh, especially if none came back, you could, it's easy to count. Uh, and uh, you know different, different theaters that have said different things or, or whatever happened. I remember when I was. Before I was a lawyer, when I was starting in business, the first business that I had, I didn't know, you know, how am I going to do this? How am I going to make a living at this? How am I going to tell people that I do this and that they're, they're desirable, they desire to have them do, do this uh, service for them? And I tried different things. I tried press releases. I tried e uh, newsletters. I tried uh, uh, networking. Uh, I tried volunteering. I tried all sorts of different things. And I, and it, and I kept track of it. And I could tell you, um, at the time, well, every time I do a press release, then this much business comes back. So it cost me $200 to get a professional press release done, but I always get business from it. And I usually get about $500, $600 a month in business. So if I put out a press release every month for $200, if I, let's say only half the time it comes back that I, that I get the business, uh, then I'm still making a good profit. I know that that works because I've seen it. You can do the same thing with submissions. I'm sending out to these 10 theaters. Let's see if anybody nibbles. None of these people nibble. Do they have anything in common? Yeah, they're, they're all this kind of, they all do this kind of work. Apparently, my, my writing doesn't appeal to theaters who do that kind of work. And you can keep track of it. It's a science. And uh, just, just, to, just to hammer the point home, it took me about a year of, in my first business of trying different things before I really got any traction. That's a lot of faith to wake up, to, to have 364 days or 365 days where you push that boulder and it does not budge, and you wake up the next morning without questioning and say, well, I'm gonna push the boulder at a different angle again. That's a lot of faith in yourself, but it works. So keep up at it and keep track of what you're doing. And notice that never once did I mention that, uh, that you're getting responses back from all the theaters that didn't produce your work. They're inconsequential to the science of getting produced, in my mind. I just wanna go back to the dating analogy just for a second. <laughs> The wife that's on my mind. <laughs> but nonetheless, you know, if you live long enough in this world and you have had a succession and you're single at some point in your life and you have a series of dates that you never hear back from, <laughs> you know, the first one stings, the second one stings, you know, never 10 or 15. It's like, you know, it's not me. <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, it's, what, do you, you know what I'm saying? It's like, or, or you're dating somebody and they drop off the face of the earth or whatever it happens to be. It's, it's, so often it's about them. It's not about you. But you have to look at it in both directions. You have to make sure it's not you first before you look at them. <clears throat> So it, 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 you have to bounce it back like basketball. So what am I doing? Am I doing everything right? And even if you don't get a response back from them, sometimes it's just about them. And what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. Another question? Yes, David. Um, well, I recently went out on a good, really good date with a, a company. Uh, I, did a, I, I did my first world premiere, and it went really well. And I'll keep this uh, half hypothetical. Let's say um, I'm a playwright named David, and I just did that particular thing, and I wanted to go on a date with Master uh, Israel Horvitz, right? Um, if I were to how did I go on to submit, this particular play, which has got good reviews, I got a DVD of it, I have it all together, I could write a great query letter. What's the best way to present it 
to you where you have this vast knowledge and history of making your place successful? To, to me or to the Gloucester Stage Company? Uh, let's I, say... I can do a thing for you. Right, right, right. Let's say, right, right. Let's say to the to the Gloucester stage. What, what's the best way? What if you, when you were still artistic director, or you would receive these queries? What's the best way to give it to you with reviews and the query, or even? The I mean, I could I could answer that dishonestly, but the answer, the, the the honest answer was that we almost constantly produced uh, plays from the Playwrights Lab that were developed in the Playwrights Lab. Uh, or plays by playwrights I knew, uh, which brings us back into the category of playwrights who dropped around and said hello. Uh, and uh, I, I have this really dark suspicion that that's the way most theaters function. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it combines a lot of things that have been said. I mean, just, just really find a theater that's appropriate for you that's in your community or a theater somewhere else in the country or in the world that's really doing the kind of play that you absolutely love. I, it's happened to me so many times in my life when I've, seen, I've come up upon a theater that just does work that really excites me. And Andy said something about, in a way, go work for that theater. But whatever you do, make uh, direct contact with, it, with that theater. And then, by the way, uh, I, I think that what I'm writing is I'm really excited about what you do, and I think that what I write fits your, your mission. So literally a phone call, yeah. rather than well, even a query. Well, one of the nice things about the internet is that now you can virtually stop by and say hi. It's not the same as going in person, obviously. But you can check theater's websites to see their production histories, to really get a sense of them beyond just a listing somewhere. Um, you can visit their different social media sites, and contact someone directly through Twitter. I mean, I've gotten several commissions just from saying hi on Twitter, which is crazy when you think about it, but it's crazy. It's, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and oftentimes, I mean, be aware that oftentimes this is going to be a marketing intern or just someone who's tangentially involved in the, the literary part of the theater. But they'll interact with you, and they'll be able to tell you who to talk to or who to say, Here's so and so. We've talked to him. Um, let's introduce you guys. Maybe, maybe it would. And the thing is, with those intern people who develop relations, those people aren't going to be interns forever. Mm -hmm. Right? They're going to be exactly. the literary manager in the future, mm -hmm. and you're going to want to become one of their playwrights. <laughs> <Yay. laughs> we love them. Did you have a, um, your hand? Yeah. Um, could whoever wants to talk about um, the benefits of going to grad school? In terms of getting getting like produced and stuff like that, and getting you know, like, yeah. answer, yeah. Like, yeah. Like, yeah. Like, yeah. Like, <laughs> Academics among fighting is, is is so vicious because the stakes are so small. The joke we used to tell. The thing about going to grad school, the reason to go to grad school is because you want to get the degree so you can teach. That's the main reason. I don't think it really, unless you're going to a place that is a specific group for playwrights like the University of Iowa Playwrights Lab or, or the Yale, I think that it makes a difference because of the networking that you encounter through there. But uh, you know, most, a lot of, lot of uh, colleges or universities have MFA programs. And the re like I say, the reason to go there is because you want that degree because it's a union card. You know, a lot of, you can't teach unless you have that degree. I teach at work. I teach a workshop at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. They actually have a PhD, a creative writing PhD, as, as well as an MLA. And I, I do it essentially because I'm an obsessive golfer. That's a good reason. What I do, for, I do a three and a half week workshop. And I can honestly say of the, of the hundred writers I've worked with, in, in their graduate program, probably 10 of them will, I feel, will have careers. And uh, I've, t I've taught at Brandeis, I've taught at NYU, I've taught all over the place. I'm not sure I see the value of going to graduate school. It maybe forces the kind of support group that I was talking about, that you're, you're in a place where there are other writers 
and you talk about writing, uh, and you look at each other's work, and you try to be as helpful as possible, and people are being helpful to you, but you can create that uh, that world at less of a cost than $45,000 a year, whatever it is now, for grad school. And prepare a nugget, uh, or two or three of wisdom <coughs> to impart to you. Um, the first thing I want to say, though, is that when we conceive of city theater and city rights, I was very insistent that we spelled it W-R-I-G-H-T-S, so that it wasn't W-R-I-T-E-S, which we all know what that is, and anyone can do that. But a play right, W-R-I-G-H-T, is, is the artist where the play begins. It is the person who is, is in charge of the art and the craft, and City Rights is about work and play. All right, come on. This is a pretty cool place, right? Yes? Thank you, Epic Hotel. <laughs> Everyone who is here today came here for you, and it is kind of a remarkable assemblage we've, we've pulled together. Very impressive. And you are, too. So I want to just thank you from me. Okay, so we, we actually had originated this as the coconuts and bolts of playwriting. I couldn't help myself. Then it sort of turned into theater, smarts, and etiquette. And I think what has been happening for these last two days is we've gotten smarter. And we have certainly learned things. We've learned the rules we need to know, and we've learned the rules we can break. And I think that that's an ongoing learning process. So what I'm, I'm going to do is almost kind of get out of the way, but not completely. But as, as I have, we have put it out to you guys, um, what is it you can impart? I'd, I'd kind of like to just go down the line a little bit so that you can say something, and then we can turn it into some of those questions and answers that I know everybody is dying to get in before we have to conclude. So is that okay? Is that all right, Pamela? Okay, good. Um, Ashley, Gary, I'm going to start with you. What do you have to say to us? <laughs> a playwright and as a playwright advocate. Um, I think you should learn how to date a theater because we often go with our hand out. And you know if you ever have had a date, somebody who comes at you with their hand out scares you. Right. As opposed to coming to the dinner table and saying, hi, this is who I am. Who are you? And do, do, do we have any common ground? And you, you know, we're, we're so, understandably, we're so desperate to be produced and to be seen and to be heard. And of course, that's in large part why we do this. But wouldn't it be interesting for you to go to a theater and say, what can I do for you first? Can I help you some way? Can I work for you some way? Can I, I and of course, I want you to know who I am. But what can I do for you besides just come with my hand out? So that there's this equitable exchange of energy gratitude, respect, and appreciation. And that way, people don't feel taken advantage of in either direction. That's my opinion. I think it's pretty good. Yeah. Okay. David Bowe, you I have, have I know, I know, <laughs> you follow that. And, ha and after I having been so it. extremely colorful <laughs> for the last couple of hours. But there, there must be something that, that you still have to tell us something so safe. Well, I would I would say that uh, in terms of uh, <laughs> etiquette, and keep in mind, there's a New York lawyer talking about etiquette, so. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, from what I see, there's a lot of, uh, well, when you're developing uh, either physical or mental skill or creative skill, uh, business skill, whatever it, it can be, it's important to develop both in terms of strength and flexibility. And no matter what you do, you'll find those two elements in any way. You ask a Zen Buddhist master about strength and flexibility, he'll know exactly what you're talking about, he or she. Uh, 
Um, and I think that's the same way when you approach a theater and you're in the collaboration project, pro, uh, process of getting, that, getting your work on stage. Uh, you want to re remain flexible, but you want to remain strong. And you want to remain balanced in that way. You don't want to be so flexible that people walk all over you because then you don't have strength. You're not exhibiting strength. But you don't want to be so strong that you're not letting anybody do anything, change a comma, or, or you know, change sets because the theater's too small or the theater's too big for what you're trying to do. So you want to uh, retain strength and flexibility. And the people that you meet who are the most powerful are also usually the most gracious celebrities and, and politicians and even royalty, for example. So strength and flexibility. Okay. Okay. Andy? So what would you what what would you tell us as for example the, the South Florida Drama Dramatist Guild rep what you've learned as a playwright locally? As a playwright? Um say I've learned so much other things. Um, as a playwright, I would say I love the, Gary's analysis of dating a theater. Um, so much has come to me in this community just because I was excited about it. Um, I was in the first 24-hour theater project the Naked Stage did before anyone down here knew me as a playwright because as I said, that's really cool, can I be a part of that? <laughs> and they said, yeah. I mean, that was the first time they had done it and I had offered help out with the logistics as I had done one in college and overnight I went from being the local theater administrator to, oh right, she writes plays. So I think if you can be, if you're, don't fake enthusiasm, but if you're genuinely enthusiastic about something, show, don't be afraid to show it. Don't be afraid to ask for things. Good. Larry, what do you have to tell us as the editor of plays? Well, a lot, but mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 um, maybe it should come back. I was thinking about, you know, the first time I heard about I was supposed to have nuggets was just now, so the one thing I'd like to tell you is that you're all playwrights and you submit your work to theaters or wherever you send it. Um, I get hundreds of plays sent to me, ten minute plays, full length plays, and it's astounding to me how many of them come in without a cover page. They don't even have the title or the author's name, just the text. Because I think it has something to do with something about Final Draft doesn't allow you to put a cover page on, or some bullshit like that. Mm -hmm. And so, and so, I get these plays now. When I get them, I file them away. And it's actually happened where six months later I opened up a file of a 10 minute play and I really liked that play and I wanted to put it in my book, but I had no way to contact the author. I didn't know who the author, I didn't know who the author, I just had the title, you know? And I did an internet search to try to find that title, I couldn't find it. So that author lost out. So please, when you send your play to anyone, what you are, I'm sure you do it when you send a hard copy submission, but if you send it, electronically, which is what most people do now, put a cover page on it with all your contact information so that then we know who to contact if we really like your play. And the other thing I wanted to say, and this is not so much as etiquette, as I think it's a, it's a tip, you know. Now, do you all know about the Dramatist source book, which lists the theaters and it, it has their um, uh, vision statements, the kind of plays they're interested in it. And a lot of those, uh, theaters say they want plays that uh, innovate a structure, unusual use of language, and all these other things. And what they're basically saying is anything but realism. We, you know, if it, if don't send us your play if it's a traditional realistic play. And so what I see happening a, a lot lately is there's a new uh, dialogue style that writers are writing in that's full free verse. It's laid out on the page and it looks like it's three verse. But when you see it in the theater, it's realism! So <laughs> what they do is it, it's, but it's a way to bullshit the theater into thinking that they're doing something with innovative use of language because they, <laughs> because they see it on the page and go, holy shit, it's full free verse. Innovative use of language. So that's a good tip for you with your realistic play. Don't lay it out on the page like a realistic play. You might have more chance of getting a production. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Israel, what do you have to tell us as a playwright, but also as a playwright who directs his own work and has also been an artistic director and is an artistic director? 
question. Can you narrow that down? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk one thing. Do you or don't you find it easy or not easy to be the director of your own work? Uh, it, it, you know, if the cast director is like actors, uh, everybody can't direct everything. Uh, and they're sometimes really famous directors who seem like a great catch for getting a show on, but they're really inappropriate for that particular play. Mm -hmm. So I'm appropriate for some of my plays and inappropriate for others. You know, and I, I hope I, I cast the director well when I take on a play. Uh, I, I don't direct other people's plays very often. It's not a talent that I feel I should inflict on. <laughs> uh, I'm having a lot of trouble figuring out. Uh, one thing I'd like to uh, say to you as a group I said in, in my uh, writing workshop, um, 37, 38, nearly 40 years ago, I started a group called the New York Playwrights Lab. And we're, we were for many years a secret, kind of secret society. Uh, we uh, kind of agreed not to do publicity for the group, that it, we didn't want to create a kind of competitive situation, or really want it to be a work situation. And the writers in that group originally were Wendy Wasserstein and Peter Barnell and me, and over the years it's been just about everybody you've heard about, uh, Lynn Nottage more recently, and and uh, Sarah Rule was part of it. And it it's, it's an ever-changing group of 15 writers. And the mission of the Playwrights Lab, when I started it all those years ago, was to keep playwrights writing for theater, because it seemed to me that everybody's impulse back in the day, as soon as the play went on and you got a little heat on your particular life or career, that you'd run off and do, people were just running off and doing television and movies because, uh, because you know, that was more money and it seemed like the thing to do. So the, the notion of the lab was that uh, we would meet in a good year every Wednesday and on sometime in September, we'd all start a new play pretty much on the same day. And then we'd show up every Wednesday with five pages of our developing plays, not four pages, not six pages, five pages. I figured out uh, when I was te back when I was teaching playwriting that uh, if somebody presented 15 or 20 pages or God forbid a whole play, the only thing they wanted to hear was, Okay, we've got the actors, we've got the directors, we've got the theater, we're ready to go. But with five pages, everybody was capable of listening to criticism. And, and, um, also, the lab sort of functioned like graduate school in that if we met on Wednesday, on Tuesday night, there'd be 15 writers saying, oh shit, I've got to write five pages for tomorrow. <laughs> and they'd write their five pages, and, and grain by grain, the desert grows, and that after 20 weeks, everybody had a draft of a play. Cut to the chase, in nearly 40 years, every single play that's ever been written in the New York Playwrights Lab has been produced professionally without a single exception. Period. So there's no question in my mind that especially as emerging writers, if you get a group, a writer's group together that's, that support groups really, really work. But don't create a group in which people bring in a full play that they wrote 13 years ago because it's, it's just not going to work. Nobody really wants to really use the model a gift for me to you of starting a new, a brand new play that they're fresh pages and you're only looking at five, five pages a week or maybe five pages every other week. I don't go beyond every other week, but that, that sort of kills it. Every week is the best and, and uh, you'll see that with five pages people are much more honest. When you get larger amounts of, of pages there's that group of people that says, it was great, I loved it, and they don't mean it. Or the people who feel obliged to say that was the worst thing I ever heard in my life. But with, somehow with five pages, honesty prevails. And you won't feel as alone as you do right now as writers. Uh, it's really uh, something wonderful. The other, the other thing I'm, 
I want to say, it has nothing to do with what I'm supposed to be saying, but I couldn't understand what I was supposed to say, uh, is that at some point, I realized that the country was larger than New York, and the world was larger than the country. And everybody comes from somewhere. And what the, the, the most wonderful thing that happened to me in my life is that I, my, my play started to get produced in other countries. And some of my plays are translated and performed in like 40 languages now. And I spend a great deal of my life uh, chasing my plays around the world, and I can't think of anything more exciting. Uh, and if, if you have friends in Italy who are writers, do a tr trade deal. Let them translate a play of yours, and you translate it, even if you have to do it with a dictionary and an Italian friend here. Uh, but really think outside of, of that particular box. And, and, and uh, having a play on in Mexico, having a play on in Canada, it's amazing. It's so, so much fun. I've had 40 of my plays, maybe 50 of my plays, uh, produced, translated and produced in France, and I've directed like 10 of them there. And I've got my own little theater, I'm a partner in a theater company in Italy now. And my father was a truck driver, and you know, I grew up in Wakefield, Massachusetts, the son of a truck driver, so I, did, I don't come from a great deal of privilege. And uh, I, I really think that almost everything is possible. So I, I give you that. Thank you. David Lohr. We're going to be talking to you later as an artistic director, so what I'd really like to ask you is, is there a tip, an internet tip, that you 